Welcome, everyone. My name is Autumn Jordan. I'm the Bird Friendly Cities Organizer here at Nature Canada. I've been in this role since 2021. Um, I'm very passionate about birds and conservation, and it's an honor to be in this role today. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and honor that I'm calling in virtually today from Nature Canada's office on the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. They've lived on this land and nurtured it from time and memorial. We thank them for their knowledge and teachings to all of us across Turtle Island. We encourage everyone on this call today to take a moment to reflect on their history and whose land you reside on. If you're unsure, please check out native-land.org for more information. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome Caitlin and Michael from FLAP Canada today to speak with you about their annual event, Global Bird Rescue Week, uh, which this year is happening uh, at the end of the month. Caitlin is the volunteer campaigns coordinator for FLAP, uh, a registered charity. She joined FLAP as a volunteer in 2016 and took on the role of Global Bird Rescue Coordinator in 2019. During spring and fall migration, Caitlin manages FLAP's building monitoring program and throughout the year coordinates their volunteers. Her work focuses on in ensuring injured birds are able to receive the medical care they need through transportation to the Toronto Wildlife Centre data collection, management, volunteer recruitment, and social media platforms, as well as organizing FLAP's annual events, are all just a few of Caitlin's roles and responsibilities at FLAP. Michael Major is the Executive Director of Fatal Light Awareness Program Canada, also known as FLAP. He has been with the organization since 1993. He's an author, speaker, and regularly delivers presentations on the topic of bird building collisions, bringing attention to the light issue that impacts over 1 billion birds across North America. Uh, and just before I pass it over to the speakers, I did want to say um, that even if you might not be aware of a bird window collision at your house, work, or um, other place, it does happen. We had a window collision here at Nature Canada's office yesterday. Um, our nationalist director, Ted Chesky, found him, basically fell in out, fall out of the sky. It is a juvenile um, male rose-breasted grosbeak, uh, and his body will be uh, used for the Safe Wings annual bird display uh, at the end of the year. But uh, there is hope, and together we can make a difference for birds in our built environment. So with that, um, I'm going to stop my screen here because in case uh, Michael wants to share, um, or would you like me to keep sharing my screen, Caitlin? Um, I think if you can keep sharing your screen, I might need you to go from slide to slide because Michael had his prepared and now his connection is not um, working out for him today. So okay. I might need you to do that for me. That's all right. Of course. No problem. Um, well, over to you, Caitlin. Thank you. So hi, thank you all for being here. Um, this presentation obviously is going to be on Global Bird Rescue and the Global Bird Collision Mapper. Um, Global Bird Rescue, the tagline, Make Every Bird Count, is an annual event that we host every year um, globally that happens at, uh, during fall migration for us here in North America, which is uh, for FLAP our busiest time for window collisions. Uh, this year it's happening from September 23rd to the 29th. Do you want me to just tell you when to go next? Okay. I can't hear you. Can you see my full screen, Caitlin? I can, yes. Okay, so it's just the slides, right? Uh, it's the slides and your tabs. I don't know why it's doing that. So we'll have to go with the tabs today. Sorry, folks. Michael, it looks like your connection is 
I'm here. Working now? Hey. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I will warn. I will warn everyone. I, I I'm very likely to be cut off here. I apologize, but connectivity for whatever reason is causing me issues. So I'm hoping we can get through this with any further problems. Okay. All right. I am going to reshare now. I'm really sorry. It's uh, bothering me that uh, you can see my tab. So. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, while you were connecting, I just gave a little um, introduction to Global Bird Rescue. Um, okay, great. We're just waiting on the next slide, and then we can start from there. Okay, thanks. Oh, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart today. What the heck? Mm, we see that? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right, now we're rolling smoothly. Okay. Do, do I begin? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I uh, Sorry, everybody. Uh, technical issues, of course. Um, I understand there's been introductions already, and uh, I'll just take the lead here at the beginning, and then Caitlin will step in and talk on another item. So we, we're going to talk out of the starting gate about one of our public awareness campaigns, Global Bird Rescue. Um, FLAP has several public awareness can campaigns, but Global Bird Rescue is one of, if not our biggest one to date. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more background on that in, in the next slides. Uh, but we'll also then, as I said, touch on Global Bird, on the Global Bird Collision Mapper, and then uh, followed by a brief introduction to the Bird Friendly Building Survey. And let's hope this works. So uh, I guess someone's going to be advancing the slides for me. Is that right? Yeah, Autumn has uh, control. Okay. So if Autumn, you wouldn't mind, hopefully she's still there. <laughs> We're, ah, there we go, good. All right, so before we jump in uh, uh, to the three main items, uh, just a brief introduction to the bird building collision issue. Uh, I'm confident that most of you, if not all of you, are aware of the severity. Um, if we look at Canada alone, there's an estimated uh, 25 million birds that are dying as a result of collision with windows. If we look at North America as a whole, we're looking at uh, uh, an estimated 1 billion birds. However, a recent study has just come out of the United States where that 1 billion has risen to over uh, 3 billion birds annually as a result of collisions with windows and lit structures. So we're dealing with uh, one of, if not the leading cause of bird death across North America. Next slide, please. So about uh, Global Bird Rescue, uh, we started Global Bird Rescue, I believe, going back six years now. And originally it was going to be treated more like a birdathon, but it's gone through uh, several revisions. And once we actually officially launched it, it, it really is uh, an educational campaign where we're trying to engage people from around the world to go out into their community um, during a designated period of time. Uh, it's a seven day period. This time, uh, the event is being held from September 23rd to the 29th. And we just encourage people to, uh, when they're out in their community, uh, look for birds that have collided with buildings and documenting those birds, uh, going into our, our global bird collision mapper. And as I said, Caitlin will go into the details of how that mapper works later on in the presentation. Um, so you're an individual, you decide to participate in this event and you can actually participate in one of two ways. You can, and if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Oh, sorry, right. The term global bird rescue, um, obviously referring to the entire planet and engaging people from around the world to participate. Uh, we've had a, a tremendous amount of success getting people participating in North America, uh, but we need more and more people to participate across the world. We've had some uh, groups in Europe, uh, I believe it's in Berlin, uh, the Netherlands, we've had uh, participants in uh, India, uh, Korea. So it's growing. It's growing as we had intended it to do, because this is not limited to here in Canada. It's not limited to North America. It's happening all across the world, wherever there is glass. So fortunately, we're seeing some buy-in happening at an international uh, global level. 
so as I mentioned moments before when I was jumping ahead, there's two ways you can participate in this event. You can participate as an individual where you can go out again into your community looking for birds that have collided with buildings. You can also just participate from your home. You don't have to go out into your community. You can just sit at home and if a bird happens to collide with your windows during that seven day period, we ask you to report those birds into the Global Bird Collision Mapper. But you can also create a team. Um, and really, this is where we're having a, a tremendous amount of uh, um, a positive results. People going out as a group into their community, actively looking for birds colliding with these buildings and, and documenting them. But I'll, I will add that this is not limited to just simply documenting bird collisions. This is an ed educational campaign. And there's a component of Global Bird Rescue that revolves around social media. And uh, I'll touch on that in the next coming slides. Um, it's very important that uh, we take these efforts and make sure that it's, it, we're, we're trying our best to educate uh, on this and how, how people can, can actually contribute uh, at a local level, at uh, a national level or an international level in trying to gain the ear not only of people in your community, but industry professionals, uh, government agencies, uh, really trying to emphasize that this is an issue. It isn't going away. It's getting bigger and bigger as we build more and more human built structures. And quite frankly, it's, it's out of control. Um, so by, uh, by putting this out on social media, it's really helping increase that awareness. And these are examples of some posts we put together that are available right on the Global Bird Rescue website um, that you can download as part of the event and post, or you can just like them and recirculate them that way. You can create posts of your own. They do not have to come specifically from our website. Uh, any, anyone making any effort to educate on any level they possibly can is encouraged. But this is, this is handy. This is a helpful resource where you can just download and circulate, okay? And these, by the way, come in both French and English. Um, and Spanish. And we try, sorry, so, and Spanish, that's right, thank and you. Spanish. And yeah. Spanish, that's correct, and Spanish. And uh, this is one of the things that we hope in the years to come that we'll be able to uh, have our entire site translated into all the main uh, languages across the world. Uh, right now we're doing our best uh, to touch on the French and, and uh, Spanish side, okay? These are examples of teams that have, have participated in Global Bird Rescue in the past. As I said, they're from all over the, all over the world. Um, for now, mainly out of uh, Canada and the United States. And there is a, a spattering of some, uh, some bird-friendly city teams in there. Our ultimate goal today is to try and get as many, if not all, of the bird-friendly city teams participating in Global Bird Rescue. And if you can click to the next slide, um, this is kind of like an addition to all these teams we want uh, all these participating teams to be looking like. We, we need your involvement in this because it is really a huge step that you can take as bird teams in your community, committee, community participating in Bird Friendly City, um, that is a, an incredibly valuable exercise for you to be doing. And it's, a, it's an incredible way to educate in your community. So if you can click to the next slide, um, that would be great. And it's just basically, uh, this is going to be an introduction on how you can uh, create a team uh, under uh, the Global Bird Rescue website and uh, be added to that list of participants. And if you can click uh, next, that would be great. Um, and to kind of give you an idea, when, when we launched this uh, event, we noticed a huge spike in the number of individuals, not only participating in the event, but those that are actually entering records into the database. And if you look at, look at our records, you can see that there's a massive spike that takes place in the fall, uh, in and around the time that we, we um, run the event. This doesn't mean it's all because of Global Bird Rescue. It's in part because the busiest time of year for us here in, in Toronto, when it comes to collisions with buildings, falls within the last couple of weeks of, of September through the first couple of weeks of October. In fact, in some cases, in some years, we can pick up 
uh, we can double the amount of birds uh, uh, we find uh, in the given year in the fall than we do in the fall. There's just more birds on the move in the fall. There's inexperienced young. The populations have increased, and therefore, you're much more likely to encounter a bird collision in the fall. But more than that, if you can click again, um, you'll notice that not only is it because of a spike in the number of birds that we're finding, it's just there's a huge number of non-flap members using the map or entering records. And this has a great deal to do with global bird rescue. And we really want to see this obviously skyrocket. And you can help, you can help do this by participating in this event. This is really an important aspect of how you can contribute locally and how you can help your community uh, receive perhaps a higher acknowledgement and certification under Bird Friendly City as well. Next slide, please. When you go on to the Global Bird Rescue website, there's a section dedicated to creating a team. And uh, if you can just kind of click a few times here uh, on them, that would be great. Um, these are uh, various uh, tools on the site on how you participate, but it's also how you register and how you can create a team. And it's pretty simple. It's not at all a difficult task to do. You basically come up with a team name, you want to have a team coordinator, and you want to have all those members of your team entered into and registered to participate in the event. Um, and uh, a, a whole uh, team therefore will land on the map, uh, with the other participants. And with that, we also ask if you have a logo, that would be great. If being a bird friendly city team, you should have your own logo. And that will be added again to the section showing all the different participants um, within the Global Bird Rescue event, okay? So uh, please don't be intimidated by it. It's really easy to register and set yourself up. Um, if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. So obviously I've mentioned uh, the Global Bird Collision Mapper a number of times uh, talking about Global Bird Rescue. Uh, Caitlin's gonna be talking uh, about this uh, mapping tool and how you can use it and how you can download it. But the Global Bird Collision Mapper is a huge uh, tool and an, an essential tool in order to make Global Bird Rescue uh, a successful event. We're seeing more and more people using this across the world. Um, I didn't see the, the latest number today, but we're now well over 100,000 entries. Um, and again, these are main in, most of these entries are coming in uh, and out of uh, uh, Canada and the United States. But uh, if you look at the numbers that are being entered, most of them are in the United States. And uh, other than with the exception of Flap Canada and Safe Wings Ottawa, who are out in the streets actively pursuing birds, uh, members of the public, those entries are really coming out of the United States. And so let's face it, Canada, it's got a huge problem with this issue. And um, we need to get more and more Canadians involved in being aware of the map, mapper itself and using the mapper to enter these records. So please, if, even, even if you don't participate through bird friendly cities, as a bird team, just keep the mapper in mind because anywhere you go, once you start to look for birds, you start to notice more. And as a citizen science uh, tool, this is an invaluable resource. So please do consider to carrying this with you everywhere you go in your day-to-day -day life, okay? And with that, I'll leave that now for Caitlin to start talking about global bird, uh, the global bird collision mapper. Thanks. Um, Autumn, if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. And then just click, I think, two times. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, to get started, um, basically on how you would be using the Global Bird Collision Mapper. So like Michael said, it's there to report collisions. Um, and so while you can actually report collisions as a guest or an anonymous user on the site, what since we're talking about Global Bird Rescue, um, we definitely recommend that you... Um, and your team uh, members create an actual team within the mapper. So I'm gonna explain what that means. So we have global bird rescue teams for the event, um, which kind of coincides with a team within the mapper. So having a registered account on the mapper allows you to submit a collision record under a registered username. Um, this allows you to view your own data and then edit it as well. If you submit anonymously, you don't really have that luxury. 
Um, and then so having a team within the mapper, uh, it means multiple usernames can enter data under the team name. So this is just really useful for filtering purposes, really for downloading purposes. So if you have 60 usernames under, let's say, well, Flap Canada, um, you can then just filter by the Flap Canada name. It encompasses all of that data uh, and just makes it really easy for those purposes. Um, so for creating an account, you can find the create an account button on the home page at birdmapper.org, which is what you're looking at here. Um, so the, the arrow on the right side is showing you where that button is and then, or the left side, sorry about that. And once logged in, you should see your name in the top corner. So we can see Michael's logged in in the screenshot there. Uh, so if you want to go next, Autumn. Oh, and yeah, okay. So we have utilized a mobile app. So the birdmapper.org is through ArcGIS. And so we have the access to Arc ArcGIS Survey123, um, which is the app that we use to access our report a collision survey. Um, it can be downloaded from birdmapper.org. So the arrow on the page is pointing you to the link there. Um, and you can also see the QR code as well. So Autumn, if you wanna go next again. Thank you. If you also on the home page scroll down, there's a section explaining how to download the app. So it's a little paragraph there. Um, it's providing you links to the Apple Store, the Google Play Store for where you can find the app. Um, and then once the app is, oh, if you go back for a sec, sorry. Thanks. Um, once the app is downloaded, you then have to like pull the survey into the app. So to do that, there's a link here in the paragraph as well. So you can either click on that with the phone that has the app, or you can scan the QR code there. Um, all it does is pull the survey into the app. So once you open the app, you see report a collision there, and then you can go right in and start using it. Michael? Right, so Justin, forgive me if you're gonna touch on this, but uh, I think it's important at this moment that people understand this app's free. This is, there's no charge oh, yeah. to this app. Some yeah. people ask that sometimes. So it's free of charge. It's just a matter of downloading it. And, and, and it was designed in such a way by downloading the app onto your cell phone, you can enter records on the go. So that as you're moving around, you're gathering the data, you're entering it right into this app. You're not having to wait to get home to enter it. Although, as Caitlin is probably going to say, you can, also, you can do it either on your phone or you can do it online through the website. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I forgot to mention it is a free app. Um, so that's good. Uh, if you want to go next again, Autumn. Thank you. So um, on the left there, that's what the reported collision survey looks like on the app. The survey collects the following data. So you can put up to three photos, the address, the side of the building. Um, you can also place a GIS marker on a map showing exactly where that bird was found. Um, it also collects the date and time of the bird found, uh, the species and the status of the bird. So you can choose whether that bird was found alive, found dead, if you found multiple, if you didn't find any birds at all, and if the status of the bird is unknown. So multiple uh, would be an instance where you find multiple birds of the same species in the same spot. It makes it easier instead of having to put one report in for each one. Uh, no birds found is a way to report that a building was checked, but you didn't find anything. Uh, An unknown can be used in certain instances like impact marks where you really don't know ultimately what happened to that bird. Michael? Uh, just, just important to add that uh, once you select say a dead bird, there's other uh, layers to that, that the whole series of other questions come up. They're not mandatory to answer necessarily, but there it's additional detail that can be gathered about a specific bird that collided with the building. So once you get the hang of it, you'll, you'll find that there's a lot of detail in there that can be useful depending on your level of interest and in the information you're gathering, okay? Yeah, exactly, that's a good point. As you go through the survey, you'll notice um, different questions pop up based on what you've already selected. So if you have a live bird, uh, another field pops up where you can put in the rehab center that it went to, uh, the case number if you wanna track it, things like that. For dead birds, you can put in a tag number if you're tagging, you can select whether that bird was scavenged by something, um, things like that. So there is additional detail in there. Um, okay, so the app, 
honestly, it makes it really easy, as Michael said, to, to enter records on the go. So when you're patrolling and you find a bird, you can put that information in right away. You don't have to write it down and take it home. You don't have to remember exactly where that bird was found. Uh, you enter it and move on, which is really nice, especially if it's a busy day and, and there's a lot going on. Um, it gives you the option as well, if you have no internet, you can just save and then send later. So you can actually save in an outbox and then send it when you're connected to the internet again. So if you don't have data on your phone, things like that, um, there are options for that as well. It also keeps a sent folder of the records that you've entered, um, which then makes editing them really easy. And you can also access the, the, ma the mapper through birdmapper.org where you can see the global map of, like Michael said, over 100,000 records. You can also edit and download the data on the website as well. Michael, before we move right. on. Right, and this might be a good time to mention what happened on holiday Monday. Yeah. Um, FLAP uh, uh, documented among its various uh, volunteers out on the streets, uh, about 160 birds um, at various locations, with the majority of them coming from one of the outlying municipalities, the city of Markham. We picked up 90 birds from a small network of buildings. Um, so this app can be quite handy being able to enter this information on the go because these de details can really be lost on a busy day. However, I will say these busy days are few and far apart. And uh, I think it's important, most people don't realize that even though these collisions are occurring on a day-to-day -day basis, you may go out day after day and not find a single bird. Um, so don't let that, I, I know this may sound strange, to say, but don't let that discourage you um, because it's a matter of persistence and, and just constantly monitoring because uh, it's amazing how these events happen one day because I, I went out after the 90 day, 90 birds we picked up on Monday, I went out the next day and I think I picked up seven birds. So it all depends on when the massive wave of birds pass through, time of, time of year, weather conditions, all kinds of variables. Okay. I just thought that'd be worth mentioning. Yeah, that's a good point, especially because if you guys didn't go out, all of those birds would not have been recorded for those buildings, right? Um, okay, so where are we? Uh, okay, Autumn, if you want to go next. Well, actually, wait a second. Um, you can see on the left side there, that's what the sent folder looks like on the app on the phone. So it lists all the reports that you've sent in on your phone, um, and you can easily go in and edit them from there. Um, the screen on the bottom is showing you what the edit page looks like on the website. So there are two options there for you to access your data. You can also download the data from the website as well. Um, and then Autumn, if you want to go next. Okay, that's pretty much what I've already said. But yeah, there's a the global map you can view and, and, and view all of the reports in the map. So if you go to the global map on uh, birdmapper.org, it shows you the global map, obviously, and um, the reports sit on the map and you can click on them and click through them and see the details. You can see the photos attached. Um, information is up there. So every record in the database, so a hundred and over 100,000, um, they're all on there and you can look through them. Michael? Yeah, sorry to keep interrupting, oh. but but uh, this is a perfect example of what a building should look like once data starts to be entered around it. Because, and the the way to get that perimeter to look the way it does, of of, of a series of numbers and dots representing where the birds were found around the building, you really have to once you get the app downloaded, you have to make a concerted effort to be able to zoom as close as you can to the side of the building where that bird was found before you click on the map to drop its location. Because if you don't, um, the dots start to be scattered everywhere. And it, there's no sense of exactly where the bird was found at that building. And that only comes from practice, but uh, very important to mention because this is an ongoing uh, sort of challenge we have with our volunteers, remembering that they have to zoom in before they click on the map, okay? Yeah, so that's a good point because the map and the app itself, um, like auto chooses your location when you're using it in the moment. So if you're recording while you're at the building and picking up the bird, 
it's going to place the marker on the map pretty close to where you are, but it's definitely important to go in and make sure you're you're moving it around and placing it as close to where that bird was found, um, just to keep the data as accurate as possible um, to look like this screenshot. Um, Perfect. Yeah, so that we do have resources available um, to help you navigate the site and the app. Um, we have a written guide page on birdmapper.org, which you can find on the main menu, which you can see here. Um, we also have how-to videos that show you the process of downloading the app, entering records, editing records, and how to explore the data on the global map. Also find those in the menu of birdmapper.org. Uh, but they're also sitting on our Flap Canada YouTube page. So either way, they're available um, either on the site or on YouTube. Uh, they should be easy, easy to find. Um, so they are there if you need help with anything mapper related. So Michael, I think I'm handing this over to you, right? You're muted. Right. Thank you. No problem. We're on to uh, the bird build building uh, survey, bird friendly building survey. This is very similar a process as you would download the uh, bird, um, the global bird collision mapper app onto your cell phone. The purpose of this app is to start tracking buildings in your community that are sort of one of three concerns. Uh, is it a problematic building that, that needs treatment? Is it a partially retrofitted building that it was great that they've done the retrofits to with birds in mind? Um, or is it even a, a building designed to reduce bird strikes but are, have only covered a certain area around the building? Um, or is it an entirely retrofitted building or built building with birds in mind? Every side of the building has some form of a treatment on it that meets the criteria that qualifies it as a safe building. So. Um, when you uh, download the app onto your phone, you'll uh, see that the way these buildings are identified are in a series of uh, cubes that are uh, different colors. I'm going to get into that in a moment on, on how that works. It's pretty simple. Um, but uh, the reason this is so important is we're really starting to see a trend in, in this movement of making sure buildings are safe for birds. And it's not... It's just about putting markers on your windows. There are some very creative designs that um, are now landing on the landscape that uh, are inspiring, quite frankly. And um, this is what industry professionals need. They need inspiration. They just don't want to stick up a series of dots on their windows. They want to be creative. And we need examples of that uh, to create that additional inspiration. But let's face it. And, and quite frankly, there are going to be far more worse buildings out there than good ones. And there are some buildings that are really quite problematic that need our help, that need to be aware of the magnitude of the problem that they're building. And this is a way of helping track those locations. So very important, if you can, consider downloading this onto, um, onto your phone as well and have that handy when you're going about your day-to-day -day life. Awesome. This is what we're asking for. Um, so uh, the way you can just get the history on the building is you click on any one of those cubes, which are also on the Global Bird Collision Mapper map. You'll see the difference in the number system for the birds that collide versus buildings that are coming from the Bird Friendly Building Survey app. Um, you click on that, you get the whole history on that building. Okay. Um, if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. One sec. Hold on. I just oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. I, wanted to, I just wanted to clarify that. Um... This bird friendly building survey is the equivalent of the report a collision survey. So the only app that you need to download for that is ArcGIS survey one, two, three, like I mentioned before, and both surveys can actually sit in that one app. So it's not separate apps, but it is separate surveys. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That's very important. You're not having a whole, have a whole pile of different apps on yeah, your phone. Yeah, it's one. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I, I mentioned the color coding earlier. The way this works is if any cube identified in red, it's a problematic building. And this is an example of a building we monitor. You can see right away why this is a problematic building. <laughs> like, no wonder birds are colliding, let alone people are, are colliding with a building like this. Uh, and, and it just is a perfect example of how deceptive a building can be and why it's so important that this, this be taken seriously and why 
these buildings need to be identified, quite frankly. Um, so yeah, the, the red ones would identify a problematic building. If you click again, um, uh, uh, an amber color is one that has had uh, some form of a retrofit done to it with birds in mind, but it only covers like 2% of the building, say. Um, one thing that we've learned is when monitoring a building, people assume the worst location for bird collisions at a given building are where they're seeing them. And the vast majority of people see birds at the main entrance ways of buildings. But when you actually monitor a building, quite often the most problematic side of a structure is those sides of the buildings where people rarely go. Uh, so um, it, it's important to keep that in mind as to why a partially retrofitted building or built building with birds in mind doesn't necessarily save the most birds possible. Okay, next image. And the green obviously is a building that has been designed entirely with birds in mind. You can't see this. This is a, a structure on Trent University out in Peterborough. Uh, the entire structure is treated with markers. Um, some of its design in terms of overhangs and uh, um, believe it or not, there's a lot of glass here, but there, there's a lot more glass that could have happened at this structure had they not thought about birds when designing it. So. Uh, obviously, a green building represents those that are may, have made a concerted effort to make sure that the entire building is in some shape or form as safe as possible for birds. Next slide. So, and using it is really easy. Uh, we just ask that the building address be entered once you've downloaded that app. Um, uh, it asks the question, are you uh, a, a team member of a Bird Friendly City team? Uh, and your list, of, uh, a list of locations will pop up. You just uh, select which uh, community you're in. And, you know, it asks questions like what type of building it is. Is it a school? Is it a government building? Um, is it a commercial building? Um, does it have treatments on it? And then it will ask you to also take a photograph of that building, hopefully showing the markers that are in of itself on that structure. Okay. And also asks, is there a noted collision history at this building? Uh, and if so, uh, is this history documented? You know, for instance, you'll, you'll even be given a list of very few, but there are uh, some applications out there, including iNaturalist, that uh, have sections dedicated to reporting bird collisions as well. So all this is compiled for each of those buildings, and we're slowly but surely going to build a massive archive here. So please use this in your community um, when you're going about doing your work, because again, it's going to be incredibly valuable information moving forward. Okay. And I think that might be it. Yeah, that's it. So what time is it? Oh yeah, we're, we're, we make good timing. Good. So I, I'm assuming this is the point. If you have questions, we're here to hopefully answer them for you. And um, both Caitlin and I hope that you really consider using both of these apps and also participating in, in Global Bird Rescue. We want to see this event grow and grow, and it just makes perfect sense that bird-friendly city teams participate in this event, okay? There we go. Thank you so much, Michael and Caitlin. I've participated in Global Bird Rescue Week for the past two years, but I always learn something new, and I know we've been chatting about doing a webinar for those two years. So I'm really happy that we were yeah. able to do that today. Um, and some of the links that you mentioned throughout the presentation, I did pop them in the chat there. So there yeah. is a link to the GBR promo package and obviously the website, the Global Bird Collision Mapper, uh, Flap Canada's YouTube channel for those uh, guides and tutorials, as well as the Survey 123 Bird Friendly Building Survey. Um, to kick us off, we have two questions uh, from the uh, attendees and uh, folks, I know uh, I forgot to mention this at the start, uh, but the Q&A function is at the bottom there. Uh, if you'd like to type in your question or if you'd rather come off mute, um, just let us know through the chat and we can give you those permissions to ask your questions to our lovely panelists directly. But the first question from Norma, um, I wanted to take a stab at this. When do I stop feeding birds? Uh, I guess my first answer to that, Norma, is it depends where you live um, yeah. and migration. Uh, but I'll pass that over to you folks. Right. Uh, 
it's a kind of a mixed bag of opinions on this one, quite frankly. Um, and, and you're right, Autumn. It, it does depend on where you live. Um, but I can use an example of my backyard. Um, I, I try to stop feeding our birds in our yard around when uh, the, the bulk of neotropical migrating birds are returning. Um, I don't do this because of neotropical migrants. I do this because we, uh, where we live here in Uxbridge, um, a few times we've had bear arrive in our backyard. Mm -hmm. They love to tear down the bird feeders, destroy them, and gorge on what seeds are in there and move on. Um, and I only mention this because bird feeders don't only attract birds, they attract other forms of wildlife. And depending on where you live, uh, that can be an exciting thing, but it can also be a dangerous thing. Um, and quite frankly, by the time May rolls around, the, even the seed eaters like chickadees and nuthatch, they're already starting to forage on other so food sources, um, primarily insects. And they don't rely on things like bird seed like they do in the, in the wintertime. So it's in your best interest to let the birds do what they would naturally do because I, 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 I think it's fair to say that kind of like humans in a way, birds can be lazy. <laughs> if they know there's an alternative food source that makes their job easier, they'll continue to return. And, and they cannot you know, even deprive themselves of some nutrients that they would normally be getting if they were out there foraging for insects and so forth. So that's my two cents worth on that. Oh, and, and then, sorry, when it comes to the fall arriving, I, I just put my uh, feeders out uh, just last week. Um, because no, there are some migrating birds like grosbeak. Uh, they, they like to get fattened up that will eat seeds from your feeder as they make this migration. Um, but the seasons are beginning to change already. And um, I'm noticing in my backyard, there's now an abundance of chickadees and nuthatch uh, arriving again. And, and it's, so, yeah, I, I think I would, I would tend to put them out around the beginning of September. Some would argue pushing that even later, but September works good for me. Thank you, Michael. We have a next question from an anonymous attendee. For those who record bird collisions within the organization, can the Global Bird Collision Mapper reports be integrated with organizational data sets? If I'm understanding it correctly, all of the data on birdmapper.org can be downloaded. Um, so at the moment, we don't have like an easy way that you can push data from the mapper to another data set that way, but it can be downloaded and incorporated into your own organizational data um, manually, if, if that makes sense and answers that question. Thank you, Caitlin. A uh, similar question from Kim at Wild North Wildlife Rescue in Edmonton. They receive calls of birds hitting windows. What would be the best way for Wild North to report these? I assume the answer is the Global Bird Collision Mapper. Yeah, so definitely using the Global Bird Collision Mapper. I know that uh, rehab centers typically don't have the time to do that themselves. So uh, as an Toronto Wildlife Center here um, gives us data for Global Bird Rescue Week as their way of participating, um, but they do so as a bulk like Excel sheet of the data from that time period. So if you were collecting collision records throughout a season and you want it to be incorporated into um, the mapper, we do have that bulk option. Um, I do have a template that shows the fields and how they should be filled out in order for a bulk upload uh, to function. So if anybody's interested in that, um, I'll put my email in the, in the chat. Um, just so you can email me directly about that and I can always send the template uh, because we can definitely do a bulk upload for you for certain instances like that. That's awesome news. Thanks, so hopefully, Caitlin. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. Yeah, I can also, I'll just pop up your contact info again too on the slide here while we're answering questions for folks. Um, yeah. So... Uh, next question from Allison. Does your team have to be a bird friendly city team or can it be a birdathon team? Does everyone have to be in the same cities? Okay. Uh, Caitlin, do you want to do that one? Sure, yeah. Uh, no, you definitely don't have to be a bird friendly city team, although that's what this webinar was geared towards. Um, but you definitely can sign up as a team of 
Uh, a birdathon team, like you mentioned, you can put together a team of friends, you can put together a team of family members or coworkers from a different place. Uh, teams are really fluid in what they can be. Some teams are just uh, one person submitting data for a small group or multiple people together at a workplace. Um, so it can be really whatever you'd like it to be. Um, does everyone have to be in the same city? Technically, no. I mean, most of our teams are groups of people who kind of patrol the same area or patrol the same city. So that is kind of how the teams are functioning right now. Um, but I would say that it's, it's not it's not mandatory. Although if you have birdathon teams in different cities, they could definitely make different teams for Global Bird Rescue. That's what I was thinking too, Caitlin, for that last point of being in different locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, um, it just as an example, here in Toronto, there's an architectural firm called Quadrangle. And uh, they are a GBR team. And what they do is the, the staff as a whole go out during their lunch break and they monitor the buildings in and around the, the building that they, they, they reside in. They're not out before daybreak. They're not out all day. They just have dedicated that block of time during that seven day period to look for birds and enter records and you know recirculate social media posts and so forth. So, and they just call their team Quadrangle, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which makes sense. So uh, yeah, there's a number of ways that you can represent yourself as a team. And uh, again, just to emphasize that you don't have to spend every minute of every day going out looking, okay? Great point, Michael. Thank you. Uh, and another question from Dawn here from Devon, Alberta. Is the Global Bird Collision Mapper active year round? For entering data, most of our collisions in northern Alberta are occurring before uh, this year's bird, uh, Global Bird Rescue Week. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Caitlin. Yeah. So, yes, uh, the mapper is open all year round. We definitely encourage anybody to enter collisions all year round into it. Um, and people definitely are. Um, we have noticed in the past that while we try to uh, line up Global Bird Rescue with our busy season, it's not always everybody's busy season when it comes to collisions. Um, so we, we definitely understand that if if you're not even seeing collisions during that week, then obviously you really wouldn't have a, a reason to create a team. I've had that before where I've reached out to international teams and we've completely missed their migration entirely. So it's timing yeah. like that where we tried to put it in a place where it was busy for everybody, but obviously that's not, um, wasn't a perfect solution. Right. Um, but definitely if you have uh, collisions from fall that you're noticing or recording, um, they can definitely be entered outside of the Global Bird Rescue Week. Right. And yeah, just uh, and to- I... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, Dawn, yeah, the Global Bird Collision Mapper, you can add data to any time. Mm -hmm. It's that's always right. up there. That's right. It's 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 on all the time, and uh, important to note that this is not limited to the daytime issue. Uh, if you are a group actively pursuing a lights out effort in your community, um, it's pre dawn as well. Uh, even though there are slightly differences, slight differences between the reasons why the birds are colliding, uh, by that timestamp of the entry, uh, gives the uh, you know, gives people the uh, indication of nighttime versus a daytime strike. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind as well. Great point. And Hannah from the University of Windsor Ornithology Club president has a great question looking to get their team more involved with GBR. Are individuals not listed as part of a group able to submit their collisions but still be tied to our group if they don't want to create an account? Um, technically, no. So how the mapper works is in the back end, there's a, a linkage happening between usernames and a team name. Um, so really the only way for a report to be submitted as part of a GBR team name or a mapper team name, um, the, the, there needs to be a registered account. So there's a username that I can associate with that team. Anybody who's submitting a record into the mapper without having a registered account, um, that report just gets put in as anonymous user. So anybody who's reporting that way, the usernames for those are anonymous user. Um, so they wouldn't really be associated with any group or any person. Um, so in order for a collision to be tied to a team, they would need to register an account. Thank you, Caitlin. No problem.
Oh, and just as I uh, got another question from Valley Zoo Conservation, uh, would bulk reporting to your team work better for organizations that are recording their own reports? Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you already have data and you are open to sharing it and want it to be on the mapper, doing a bulk entry um, is definitely an option and, and it would be much faster for you <laughs> to do that, obviously, um, if your data is already there. The only thing with bulk, um, the bulk uploading is I would have to do the bulk uploading, but you would need to send me the, the data. So the template that I have, you may need to do some formatting in order for what you already have to fit the formatting that works for the mapper. Um, so it should be less time consuming than you entering one by one, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think all around that would probably work best. Unless you have the time to go on the mapper and enter what you have. But if it's a lot, I would suggest bulk uploading. If I can just add a point to that. Um, one thing that we do see from time to time, like for instance, when global rescue actually happens, teams have registered, but they aren't necessarily entering the records until after the event's over. And sometimes it can be quite an arduous exercise for Caitlin to track down the people and try and getting the data, try to get the data. But uh, um, the, the, the beauty of, of the Global Bird Collision Mapper app is it's designed to, ca to gather the evidence, not the evidence, the collision in the moment. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of value seeing that automatically being populated on the map as it happens. Um, and also it can make for a little bit more effort down the road if you wait to do it as a bulk. So uh, if you're able and willing to download and start entering those records and get used to doing it in the moment, that, that's the best case scenario, okay? Yeah, I, I agree with Michael on that, especially for a global bird rescue, having people enter in the moment means that when I'm reporting on the numbers that we've picked up for the day, it's more accurate based on having those numbers like inflate the week after. Um, but if you have data outside of GBR, like if you have spring data from this year and you want to share it, uh, bulk is definitely the way to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I have not seen any other questions, but if folks are interested in coming off mute to ask that question, you could just pop that into the chat and I can give you the permissions there. Uh, and just a reminder for uh, getting in touch with Caitlin for the bulk upload template. Her email is right here, mapper at flap.org. Um, was there anything else we might want to mention before we sign off today, Michael and Caitlin? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, well, want to thank Nature Canada for the opportunity here because, you know, we're trying to raise awareness about not only the work we're doing, but the, we feel we have a tremendous amount to offer here with these apps that we share with you today. And we really believe that Berkeley City is a great, you know, uh, area to use these resources. So, so thank you for this opportunity. And also thank Nature Canada because Nature Canada... Um, uh, helps financially support Global Bird Rescue. Um, and without that financial support, it'd be a lot tougher for us to run this program. So I want to thank you directly, Autumn and, and Ted, uh, for your helping uh, make that happen. And uh, yeah, just really hope you'll take this to heart and give this a test drive this this fall. It's, uh, what, three weeks away. Three less weeks less away. Than... Is less than three weeks away. I can't believe yeah. it. Um, and, uh, you know, your involvement would be ideal. Okay. Oh. And our pleasure, our pleasure, Michael. Um, it's always one of my favorite parts of the year and Nature Canada is um, always happy to help support and raise awareness for this important event. See Ted's hands raised. Uh, oh, Ted. Go for it, Ted. <laughs> uh, thanks, you can hear me? Oh yeah, no, I I just wanted to extend that that thanks uh, from you, Michael, to uh, to our support um, for nature, uh, the environment and climate change uh, the <laughs> climate change Canada and Canadian Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is a really important issue for them as well, and uh, they're the major supporters of the Bird Friendly City program, and uh, and they uh, you know they have their mandate to uh, to support the. the Migratory Bird Convention Act, which is the law we have in Canada that um, is supposed to protect our migratory birds. Um, 
So we all have our part to play, and we're delighted that you guys can can do this and have, have created this really great public awareness program, and we're just glad we can support it in some way and happy for the partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. How many do teams say- do we have signed up? Uh, let me let me check. <laughs> yeah, you, you check quickly. I, I do I do want to add something very quickly about the value of our data. This has only started to happen since the law was introduced in 2013 that made it man, not mandatory, that made allowed it try this again, that made bird collisions with buildings an offense. Um, and just recently the federal government is now stepping up, recognizing that this is something that really does need to to be taken seriously. And they're they're looking closely at perhaps doing investigations on buildings. And look, we're not, we're not interested in seeing people being penalized here. And very rarely do people get penalized under the law. They're always given the opportunity to meet the law. And if they comply and follow through, then everyone carries on with their lives. But it's one thing for sure that we've learned through the years is the majority of these buildings will not do anything to reduce bird collisions at their buildings if they have a big problem, unless they're forced to do it. And so the data that goes into the map is proving to be invaluable here, because this is what's needed to, to illustrate how big the problem can be at a given building. So another really important reason why the app can come in handy and you're, you're entering the data is, is so important, okay? Totally. Well, thank you again, Michael, Caitlin, and Ted. Thank you to Environment and Climate Change Canada and the CWS. Really excited to see how this year's Global Bird Rescue Week goes. Oh, Caitlin, I forgot. Do we have the number of teams? Uh, we do. So far, we have nine. Um, there's all, there's still time, obviously, before the event, and we always have a push kind of right before it starts signing <laughs> up. Uh, so that number is definitely going to grow. Awesome. And yes, Allison, this webinar is recorded and will be made available on Nature Canada's YouTube channel. I'm going to stop the recording now.